Welcome attendees. Thank you for joining us for this panel called Discover Julie's Bicycle and the Creative Climate Leadership Program. It's part of the 2023 Folk Alliance International Conference. My name is Tressa Levisser. My pronouns are she, her. And by way of a visual description, I am a woman with light pink skin, raspberry colored glasses, and brown curly hair. And the room behind me has long, shiny pink and brown curtains and a couple of lamps. I serve as the Program and Community Engagement Manager at Folk Alliance International. Before we begin, let's take a moment to note that we're joined today by folks from around the globe and to collectively recognize the importance, complexity, and the difficulty of offering land acknowledgements in the context of online gathering, uh, organizing, and collaboration. I myself am joining you today from what is colonially known as Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, which is not only the ancestral and traditional, but also the contemporary land of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, the Erie, the Huron-Wendat, the Neutral, and the Mississauga of the New Credit, among many other Indigenous nations who have lived on and work on and in relation with this land. We invite everybody who is tuning in today, whether that be in person or online, to not only join in acknowledging our shared responsibility to work towards reconciliation, but also to commit to taking personal, meaningful, and ongoing measurable action towards healing the legacies of colonization, forced migration, and cultural erasure. Now it is my great pleasure to introduce our moderator today, who will then introduce our panelists and lead the discussion. Um, all of the panelists today are joining us thanks to the generous efforts and personal invitations of Chiara Badiali, who is the music lead at Julie's Bicycle, an extremely important and influential organization, not only in the UK where they're based, but globally when it comes to climate responsibility and taking action in the performing arts sector. We are so excited to feature this discussion about Julie's Bicycle. Welcome, Kiara. Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction, Tressa. Um, as Tressa said, my name is Chiara. My pronouns are she, her. Um, I work at Julie's Bicycle and today I'm tuning in from Glasgow in Scotland. Um, I guess land of the colonizers rather than anything else. Um, and I'm a white woman in my nearly mid thirties, um, sitting in front of a beige wall uh, with short blonde hair that is probably looking a little bit messy right about now. Um, and I'm really glad today to be joined uh, for this conversation by Ben Finley, Petra Piroinen and Krista Bradley, who will all introduce themselves uh, in a bit more length uh, very shortly. And they've all been brilliant participants in our Creative Climate Leadership program over the last few years and are doing fantastic work in their own contexts. Um, so to give you a little bit of background, um, Julie's Bicycle is a not-for-profit. Uh, we mobilize the arts and culture to take action on the climate and ecological crisis, supporting them to become net zero carbon and restore nature, inspire public action on climate and ecology, and champion environmental justice and fairness. Um, we were founded by the UK music industry in 2007, but now work across the arts and culture, both in the UK and also with partners internationally. Um, and we have a few kind of founding principles and values, um, recognizing that the climate crisis is a cultural crisis and that to build the consensus for the action that we need, we need a shift in cultural attitudes, narratives and practices. Um, uh, recognizing the power of culture um, and that arts and culture play a powerful role in our lives and can inspire audiences, shift hearts and minds and create new ways of living and working together. Um, we're guided by a deep respect actually for science, data and expertise in a lot of different forms. Um, and so we always try and refer to robust information and research uh, in our work. And of course, justice and fairness, um, recognizing that the climate and ecological crisis has its roots in harmful systems um, and unfairly impacts those who have contributed least to its causes. Um, 
and fundamentally that it takes everyone. So the collective strength of the cultural community is what leads to that unified movement of action, um, bringing together different perspectives and voices, all working towards a shared purpose. Um, so at Jews Bicycle, we really try to work at every level of the cultural and creative ecosystem from individual freelancers and artists to grassroots groups and networks and also organizations and institutions and, of course, cultural policymakers and funders, bringing together that cultural and environmental expertise so that we feel and are um, by the creative community, with the creative community and for the creative community in the climate action that we create. Um, Creative Climate Leadership is one of our main programs um, and it works to support and empower artists and cultural professionals to take action on the climate and ecological crisis with impact, creativity and resilience. Um, and it came about because at JB we have that immense privilege of working with change makers every day across different parts of the creative community working in different sectors and art forms. Mm -hmm. And we can always see and feel that emergent um, creative climate movement, but we know that actually people on the ground often don't. Um, so we kept coming across stories of people who were sort of felt like they lacked connection, who were worn down from pushing for change, you know, not always confident enough actually to speak out and recognize themselves as the leaders that, that we knew they were. Um, and at the same time, there was also a really conspicuous uh, lack of climate and environment in sort of traditional cultural leadership development courses. Um, and it felt like that really needed to be addressed um, if we were going to create a creative community that was connected and future looking and meeting its own responsibilities to everyone and everything that we share the planet with. Um, and so I guess to make something feel more real, you, you create that space and you give it a name. And that's where creative climate leadership came from. Um, so as part of the program, we bring together groups of 24 people in each case. Um, it's very interdisciplinary. So we try and, again, have representation across different art forms from museums and heritage to music industry to film photography, um, community arts work. Uh, and also a different spread of roles. Um, so we see leadership, not just as executive or senior leadership, but again, trying to have people who are at the start of their careers, um, who are working in policy, who are funders, who are freelancers, artists who represent institutions um, at all different career stages to really come together and think about what is it gonna take to change this overall cultural ecosystem and how can we work together towards a shared aim? Um, so we now have about 174 alumni globally working in 28 countries from seven courses that we always deliver in partnership, um, depending on where we are. Um, and throughout the course, we look at the big picture like climate science, policy and justice, social change movements, seeing ourselves in relation to those systems and systems change, um, practical ways of making change happen, how we get out there and advocate for what we want to see. Um, and of course, every participant on the course um, commits in some way to running a legacy project and sharing their knowledge um, after we finish. And that can take any shape or form, whether it's, you know, blogs or running workshops in their own institutions. But we've also had people organize big conferences, um, huge public art installations to give you kind of an idea of the, the sort of ripple effects that we see. Um, We've just finished a program in Sweden and Scandinavia in 2021 to 2022 um, with 50 alumni and the projects they've run have already reached more than 2,500 other artists and cultural professionals and about 20,000 public audiences. And that's just the ones that we know about. Um, so really this is about creating agents um, for transformation and giving recognition to all these brilliant people who are making change in the arts, culture, music, film, photography, and more connecting them to learn from each other, um, start new collaborations and make the change that we need to see. And I'm really, really pleased to have three of them joining us here for this conversation today. Um, so first I will hand over to Krista, um, Krista Bradley, who's Director of Programs and Resources at the Association of Performing Arts Professionals. Krista, Great. over to you. Thanks, Kiara. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Krista Bradley. My pronouns are she, her. Um, I am a black woman, brown skinned woman with short curly hair and I'm wearing dark blue glasses and a plaid scarf and a green v-neck sweater and my background is my office with some plants and my peloton in honor of Julie's bicycle. 
Um, <laughs> Uh, I am coming to you from uh, Washington, D.C., um, the ancestral lands of the Pamunkey, Piscataway, and the Anacostan people, um, whose ancestors have um, taken care of this land and stewarded this land for time immemorial. I want to pay tribute to um, the elders and, and the current folks uh, and their generations that follow them. Uh, in my work, I um, am director of programs at the Association of Performing Arts Professionals, fondly known as APAP. Um, APAP is the National Service Advocacy and Membership Organization for the Live Performing Arts Field. We are dedicated to developing and um, supporting a robust performing arts presenting, booking, and touring industry, and the professionals that work within it. Um, we are best known for uh, the APAP NYC conference that happens in January every year, uh, where um, artists, presenters, producers, um, other folks working in the field, agents and managers convene in New York um, as the largest convening of the live performing arts industry around the country, around the world. Um, and it is meant to be a, a celebration and time for people to um, build community, to access information and professional development, to conduct business and um, book tours, um, and also to discover work and partners. Um, I, um, uh, in my work, I run that programming for the conference and I also run our year round programming for our members, which includes um, deeper intensives, um, workshops, um, networking opportunities for um, the community to connect and for us to be responsive to um, the changing issues that our field is facing so that we can give um, our field and our members the opportunities to navigate the changes in effective ways. I am looking forward to this discussion to with my colleagues um, who have gone through the program and hopefully lifting up and getting you all excited about the role that we play as creatives in this field and our responsibility um, to change the way things are working for a more sustainable practice. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Krista. Um, and I think to put that in context as well, you were on the CCL USA program in 2019, just as COVID was really starting to hit everyone. Um, yeah. yeah, we were actually uh, in um, our meeting in March 2020. We stopped it early uh, when everything shut down. So we can talk more about that. <laughs> Um, and next we'll hear from Petra, um, who is executive director of our festival in Finland um, and who was on the CCL Scandinavia course, which took place online earlier this year. Um, again, a bit of last minute reshuffling still due to the pandemic. Um, <laughs> um, but fortunately, we did get to bring some of the participants together in Stockholm in November this year. Um, so Petra, over to you for an introduction. Thanks, Kiera, and also to Krista and Ben. I feel super excited about the discussion we're about to have. This is definitely one of my favorite subjects. Uh, so my name is Petra Piiroinen, and um, I'm white female on my early 30s. People do tell me that I look a bit younger, <laughs> have a kind of dirty blonde hair, braided today, and I'm wearing a white jumper made by my grandmother. On my background, you can see a bit of our festival office, actually, which is very messy at the moment. There's some festival posters and all sorts of stuff <laughs> that could ever be needed at a festival. <laughs> and um, I'm joining from Helsinki, the capital of Finland. And um, I absolutely want to acknowledge the indigenous people of Finland, because I think there might be some people in this space who maybe don't even know that much about about our indigenous community. There is a really a kind of beautiful community in the northern Finland in Lapland, taking space over three different countries. And um, Finland definitely has a lot of work to do to even meet the UN goals of indigenous rights in that sense. Sami people in Lapland, big shout out to them. Um, I work with our festival 
It's a chamber music festival, it takes place here in southern Finland by Lake Tuusula. I could tell you a lot more about this festival. It's kind of a small to mid-sized. We've been recognized with several awards that, of course, maybe bring, bring some prestigious kind of feeling, but our festival is very kind of laid back. We try to keep the threshold towards classical music very low. I really like the way uh, our past artistic director, Pekka Kuusista, said it, that this is a festival where we consider the content to be more important than dress codes or good behavior. And uh, we focus on classical music of all eras, also mostly mostly new music, but are quite multidisciplinary and, and do have other kinds of arts forms and music as well. It takes place last week of July annually for 26 years now. And I'm very much looking forward to discussing with you. My CCL experience is very fresh. We just had this meeting in Sweden in October, and it's been quite a journey, to say the least. Everything that Kiara was saying earlier was like, oh my god, you're talking about my life. <laughs> That's really, really, really cool to hear. I'm looking forward to the discussions. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Petra. And last but definitely not least, uh, we've got Ben Ben Finley, who is a composer and also uh, grew up on a music festival farm, West Ben. Um, but I'm not even going to try and cover all your other accolades. Um, and again, Ben uh, was able to join us for the Creative Climate Leadership Programme that we just ran in Canada uh, this August together with our partners, uh, the Centre for Sustainable Practice in the Arts. So over to you, Ben. Thank you so much. Um, hello, everybody. I'm also super excited to be here and to talk about these uh, these things with you all. And and um, yeah, so my name is Ben Finley, and uh, my pronouns are he and him. And I'm a white man in my early 30s. Yes, I'm still early 30s, I think. Um, and I'm wearing a black and and gray sweater mostly, uh, and I have some orange walls around me that were painted by my landlord, who's a visual artist, who also painted uh, the painting behind me there, which is blue and, uh, and red. And uh, I also have a green blanket that's covering some of my electric bases, which I love, um, which I'll talk about a little bit too, but I'm, I'm joining you from uh, Guelph, Ontario, which is the lands of the Mississauga of the Credit and uh, the ancestral lands of the Attawandran people. Um, Treaty 3 territory. Um, so my uh, one of the pivotal moments in my life was when I was 14 and I discovered the electric bass and I played a string and my whole world changed. It just fell into this peaceful kind of stillness that resonated vibrations through my whole body and just um, just kind of made everything connected and and so that's been such a influential thing that I try to continue to take take on and and it's actually come uh, away from the base now into other areas of my life as well um, but that ties into another story which is growing up on this music festival farm which is quite an unusual way to grow up I suppose <laughs> um, so I grew up in this rural, place in Ontario uh, where my family and the community started this music festival um, where they created a barn in the middle of an open field with sliding doors that open up into the surrounding sounds and rolling meadows of the place. And when you listen to music there, you not only hear the music of humans, but you hear the music of birds, you hear the music of frogs, and the wind does a cross breeze through the, the place itself. Um, and growing up, I thought that was kind of just a normal experience, I guess. <laughs> um, but later on, I realized how influential it was actually to me in terms of how the arts and the surrounding lands on which we partake in the arts are so interconnected and how I love to see that relationship sort of blossom and feed into each other. 
And as time went on in the music festival, I started to think too, what is our responsibility to these lands in which we are situated? Um, and it took a different kind of listening, I think. It took a listening and collaboration to know what kinds of birds were on the property, which birds were starting to disappear, uh, what were the effects of development and land use around the area, how did that affect all of these other kinds of musical sounds in, in, the, in the festival. So we, I've, be, I've become more involved with the festival as a sustainability coordinator, and I'm really interested in networking with other festivals on, to see how other festivals and other arts organizations are grappling with these issues um, and, and how specific it is to the local places that we are, right? The local context that we are. So um, anyways, we can talk more about, about all that. But anyways, I'm, I'm looking forward to connecting with, with you all and just exchanging and, and learning from you all and grateful to be here. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Ben. Um, so I guess you, you've kind of started us off on, on that journey a bit, but um, we'll start off with, with Krista um, and Petra and then maybe come to you if you want to add anything else, Ben. But really, what, what drew all of you to want to participate in creative climate leadership? Um, maybe Krista first? Sure. So I work in the industry that moves artists across borders. <laughs> um, so touring Yikes. is uh, such a large part of what uh, APOP does and our members do um, and uh, our field does. Um, so the whole idea of, um, of us firmly making our living on moving across borders um, both for ourselves as creatives or our institutions, um, all in the hopes of trying to connect artists and audiences is a wonderful thing. Um, it's just that, you know, how do we do that sustainably um, and that we're contributing to so much um, of the impact on our planet? Uh, how do we rethink the way that we do this? Um, and I, I had an aha moment at a at a funder convening where, where just it just struck me that all that we do is <laughs> um, is contributing to this and how do we change practice? So that was one driver for me, um, being the the service organization for this field, the organization that both supports um, our members and also helps lead our members um, to think differently, to introduce them to new practices, to help them navigate and gain the skills or incentives to try to do things differently. The other piece is that APEP NYC, um, our, our conference typically brings 3000 plus people of your closest friends around the country and around the world to New York. Um, and so as a convener, what is our responsibility for um, our field as a convener, you know, can we can we convene in a different kind of way? We work with lots of different other conveners, like our friends um, at Folk Alliance um, and other regional conveners um, and our our Canadian friends. Um, so, how do we do this differently, and how can we work more in tandem with each other? So, those are my two incentives for wanting to apply to um, CCL and thought that, you know, in the position that I have and the role that APAP plays, we have a responsibility to learn more and figure out ways that we can leverage our um, resources and our position to make a difference. Fantastic. Thank you, Krista. And um, what about you, Petra? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm finding so many things that resonate with me, with me and Ben and also with me and Krista because our festival is an international festival. We are having people come from abroad. We just had five people fly in from the US last summer and kind of my heart died a little, but it was really <laughs> great as well. And um, at the same time, our festival also takes place in this quite, quite idyllic and like this area that has a very specific place in Finnish cultural history and it's surrounded around this lake, Lake Tuusula. And about 100 years ago, a bunch of Finnish, Finnish artists moved there from Helsinki. It's about 30 kilometers from, from our capital to kind of be away from the city bustle. And uh, well, the most famous one, which one people probably recognize also abroad is Jean Sibelius, the composer. 
And uh, they built these beautiful villas in this area and we utilize those as our concert venues nowadays. And it's all kind of surrounded by nature and the lake kind of brought them together. And the lake nowadays is terribly polluted. It's mm. like, it's bad. I think that's why um, the sort of ethos of our festival going back 25 plus years is is sort of we've always kind of considered the environment because we are literally just like Ben's case as well right in the middle of the festival we all stay overnight there in this old villa and and kind of feel the surroundings very very sort of tangibly so yeah we we've, we've paid attention quite early on and uh, what what brought CCL to me was a lucky strike um, from a Facebook group, some really random Facebook group. There must have been like 24 hours left to apply for the Scandinavian cohort, and I was like, "Well, okay, I need to need to do, do this because uh, it seemed to answer all of my needs." I've been working with this festival for what like five years, five six years now, and um, I've just come to realize how difficult it is at times i think in two particular ways firstly i'm mostly alone so i'm i do everything like literally everything <laughs> and and uh, the resources are well they are what they are i'm kind of lucky because i'm very interested in this side of things i do you need to make a disclaimer that i did study biology for a while i have a bit of background over there as well and um it's, it's a very lonely job. And even in my kind of collegial network, it's not really such a popular topic. And there was a few sort of instances where I would, you know, peep out in some meetings or conferences, like, what about climate change? <laughs> and and uh, the response would be disappointing. And I felt very alone. <laughs> and that there is, is a kind of certain places in Finland festival scene where there would be a conference and then there's the one slot for sustainability. And I realized that I'm always in that slot kind of as a role of sort of a angry young, per young person. <laughs> and, and I thought that, okay, I need to do something about this. And then the other thing was just the sort of, okay, so that's the lack of resources and then the community. The kind of realization that yeah i can try and do the things that i can with this kind of small festival okay we have maybe a bit wider impact than the size of the festival because it's a kind of well well known and very established event um but having a network and sort of a collective around these things is so important it's just and uh, well being part of the course have has has taught me how important it actually is Mm. Fantastic. Thank you, Petra. And Ben, what about you? Sure. Yeah, I, I feel a lot of similarity, similarities mm -hmm. to both what Krista and Petra were saying. Um, for me, the community was a huge part of it. I think trying to find some motivation or just feel the motivation. And I think so much of that comes from being with others doing this kind of work. And um, it's so inspiring just to be in the presence of other people like like everyone here. Um, to just continue the motivation to see what we can do in our own little areas, our own little corners of the world, and then to try to take that forward. So I think that was something I was looking for and something I feel like that really happened. Um, similarly, in terms in speaking about the lack of climate, I guess, education and, and action within the industry, creative industry, industries, um, certainly like it's not a part of music education in a deep way or anything like that. And I assume it's similar for other arts. Um, so I think a lot of it has felt like self initiated. And so I was interested just to see in what that kind of education would be. And I think because of the nature of the issues, um, it sort of has to be interdisciplinary, right? So there has to be these kind of networks that are building. So, I, I was just looking for that, I think, in partnerships. And um, yeah, and uh, pleased to have found it. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Ben. I think um, uh, one question I have for you all is 
Um, whether there's like a really specific highlight or actually borrowing that aha moment phrase from you, Krista, um, <laughs> that you took away from your experience at CCL um, that you would want to share with other people as well? Well, yeah. Um, so our our meeting, our first U.S. consortia met at the Biosphere in um, Arizona, and we were there March 16th through March 22nd <laughs> of 2020. <laughs> so um, by the third day, uh, you know, as we were hearing about shutdowns, um, we, you know, most of us left early, but I think the big aha moment for, for us and maybe for my cohort is that here we were meeting together um, to talk about a global issue, um, a crisis that would require um, enormous mobilization, interdependent strategic response, um, and that would um, force us to maybe think about things in our individual roles differently because we needed to be um, a more collective unit kind of solving a problem. And at the same time, our world was shutting down by a global pandemic that was requiring the entire world to rethink and to step back and figure out how we're gonna deal with this. And I get chills every time I think about it because it was just such a seminal moment. Um, and there was urgency around the this, uh, synchronicity of all those things happening. Um, and I um, that was my big aha moment and trying to hold on to that as we moved through the pandemic has been um, both wonderful and really challenging because now that we're two and a half, two, three quarters, almost three years um, from that moment, the world is wanting to go back um, to the way things were um, or to just move out of this phase so that we can get back to normal or move forward to normal. Um, and um, the crisis hasn't gone away. <laughs> Um, we still have to kind of keep our attention um, raised around this. And as APAP, um, you know, we're also trying to help this industry um, thrive again, um, get business back um, moving, get uh, artists and arts organizations um, back to a place where they are sustainable, but not back, but move forward in a way that's, um, that takes all of the lessons that we've had you know, both the, um, the environmental and the health and the racial crisis and reconciliation and um, uh, not reconciliation, but it's just a racial reckoning. Um, how do we kind of take that forward? So I think that's, that was my aha moment. It's still my aha moment of how do we kind of hold true to this um, as we are moving through um, and what does it mean What's our what's our responsibility moving forward um, in this time? Thank you, Krista, um, Petra, or Ben. Who wants to share next? I can I can go. I I think I maybe everyone in this course have this kind of feeling. Okay, Krista is your cohort. That was special, <laughs> <laughs> but, but I also feel like when our cohort started. It was maybe just, just a few days after the ICPP re report last spring, which also felt like yeah, it was one of those moments when people were like, yeah, like this is not great. It's not looking very good. But it was also the first ICPP report that had culture mentioned in it. So it was kind of, it was an interesting time to start the course. And well, definitely the aha moment, the first one for me was that, hey, it's actually quite, well, not easy, but it's feasible to talk about these things when you are in a safe space with people who don't continuously question your agenda or or, or the science behind this. It's It made a huge difference. And I'll have to have to say that the space that I don't think I've ever been in sort of remote situation or, or space that, that we had with this course throughout the course, because when, when our um, Judy's bicycle sort of lead of the course, Sherry's, 
made made the sort of setup of of the thing in, in such a way that we all felt really heard and safe and sort of we were there together i haven't experienced anything else online ever <laughs> it was really empowering i think the other thing for me throughout the course was that um this is even more complicated than i had thought and i think i had quite a good idea before but seeing maybe i went there a bit like yay our festival is gonna lead the change in finland or whatever of course together with many others but i had many of those moments when i realized that oh i haven't considered that we need to take into consideration this and this and that and those and those stakeholders as well and yeah it's complicated but the only way to get to it is to get the bigger picture which i definitely got from the course so that was two aha moments right i hope Thanks. there's some left for a bit yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Come on. laughs> go ahead ben. um well i just want to echo one of the things which is just the I think the peer learning sort of model is just hearing from everybody else and just, um, yeah, feeling empowered in, the, in that sense. And then on a very specific session level, there were, and I also want to just amplify again how much we learned from each other as a group, because um, we also had guests as part of the program, which was also a really interesting experience. And in the one that we did in Alberta, we had a lot of guests from that local area as well. Um, and one of the guests was um, Deandra Brucehead, um, who is a Blackfoot woman. And she, I, that session just really resonated with me on such a profound level. Um, and she, she was weaving so many different um, forms of, of indigenous knowledge, traditional ecological knowledge, uh, Western science. She was also a sort of sustainability um, climate change. I can't remember her official title, climate change, uh, worker for her community, her, for her First Nation too, but she, she had a very specific um, goal that she was working towards, which is to bring back the buffalo in that area and to create a corridor uh, between communities for the buffalo to uh, once again reclaim its, its, uh, its her, you know, grazing and, and ability. And, and so she talked about to the uh, she just talked about it on so many levels at once, including the cultural level of what this does to bring people together to reclaim, um, you know, all of these practices, but also these scientific experience, you know, of how uh, the carbon capture of what these buffalo contribute to the environment as well. So speaking on these ecological cultural levels, um, that session just really stood out to me and, and uh, as an amazing case study that, um, yeah, was very inspiring. Brilliant. Thank you all. I think, um, yeah, as Chris has said, sort of discovering that community and being inspired and, and from all of you, what, what really seems to come through is, is that challenge of how we work in a broken system while also trying to change it, um, sort of embracing actually also the complexity of how much this intersects with different crises and, and how we hold true to that and hold steadfast with that vision of dedication and responsibility for change and transformation. Um, and I'm always massively inspired by everyone who comes on the creative climate leadership kind of programs. And again, sort of learning from each other in different ways and, and also carrying that forward, I think, through the different programs and cohorts. Um, there are certain things that are always the same and then certain things that do change over time. Again, as, as we, I think, as Judy's Bicycle and our partners also take things away from the different groups that we work with. Um, so it's really valuable. Um, I wonder if you all might share um, a little bit about kind of a specific impact that CCL has had on your work um, and specifically whether there's like a new favorite climate or environmental initiative or project that you've worked on since um, finishing the course. Don't know who wants to go first, Petra. Maybe I can uh, catch up on what you just said, uh, Kara, on the broken system. I think that's something that hit home for me during the course and that I've been using a lot after about how we are functioning, especially in my case, 
in the classical music scene, which is not a structure that would support any kind of change. I mean, we are literally still in many places just playing music that's 200 years old. And um, the whole, whole structure of our industry is, is it's just not sustainable in so different, many different kinds of ways. That, that was something that I realized that sort of, yes, I'm working with our festival, but at the same time, I'm really trying to work to change the system, which is hard, but I'm not alone anymore, which is great, uh, not only from CCL, but also from my CCL project, which is a part of a longer project that we have at our festival. We got funded by the Gonef Foundation, which is one of the biggest foundations in Finland for a three-year program where the goal is to sort of find the pathway towards functioning in a carbon neutral way in the kind of third sector, non-profit sector of the arts in Finland. And I've uh, kind of collected this group of peers around me. And we've had two meetings already now with this group and uh, we're going to continue throughout the, throughout the whole program. So this was the first year, two more years to come. And it's great. It's kind of like our own mini CCL, not in a sort of high high level. It's more also about people venting about their issues and we're trying to solve them together. But definitely also the CCL program kind of gave me the confidence of speaking up and being like, hey, I actually know something about this and maybe I can help you and we can all help each other out. And uh, that is also a part of the system change. There's now 12 festivals in the network and they're from all around Finland, like starting from really, really high up in Lapland to very southern points of Finland. And they're now all also kind of agents in their own area. And, and yeah, I think that's what we need. And that's at least something that I can now, now do or feel comfortable doing. So, yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Petra. Um, ben or Krista, which one of you would like to share next? Krista, go ahead. <laughs> well, my um, my initial plan was to turn our APEP NYC 2021 into a focus on sustainability, but that that kind of shifted because of the other things that were happening in our world. Um, and they have continued to shift for the last, you know, couple of years because of the, just the immediacy of the pandemic and its impact on the live performing arts industry. That said, you know, the, the, the work and the plan um, and the dream really is how do we foster an initiative that helps the, tour, the touring industry realize a new way to be and to incentivize it. I would like to see a funding program um, that we help fund and plan for that incentivizes new practices for slower touring mm. and for ways to um, foster collaboration across um, different presenters in different regions um, and to look at different kinds of residencies um, that we can um, that we can support and to learn from that process. I feel like that's the thing that I want to see, and I want to see APAP and our colleagues work together on that because um, it's hard not to be selfish. <laughs> it's hard not to be selfish as a presenting organization. You know, we're all trying to just get back. And, you know, it's so hard right now. We don't know how to track audiences. We know, no, not everyone's coming back. The money's, you know, drying up because the pandemic is, you know, subsiding as an endemic. And um, it's very, it's very hard. And um, the idea of having to collaborate and share resources and think about the funding of these things differently um, seems like an obvious solution because when resources are scarce, you need to find different ways of working. Um, but it's hard to do that when you're just trying to put out fires and like deal with the day to day. So just, I think that we need um, some sort of initiative that, that encourages and incentivizes this. I also um, was really intrigued by uh, hearing from some chamber music uh, uh, musicians and, and other musicians who toured in the first 
couple of uh, years of the pandemic, realizing that um, they didn't want to tour as much as they have been just to make a living. It's really, really hard to be a touring musician um, or a touring artist or a touring, you know, whatever discipline that you are. And why should you have to work in that crazy, unsustainable way so that you can live in a, in a sustainable way that um, takes care of your family, takes care of you, takes care of your health? Um, so I think that there's another incentive here, like how can we as an ecosystem help artists make a sustainable living and tour and move across um, regions in a way that um, is healthy for them, is healthy for the places where they're visiting, that gives more people an opportunity to access and connect with artists rather than saying, I'm sorry, you can't come to my community 50 kilometers out of my venue because that's in the radius clause. So you have to actually move, you know, you got to go further away because we need to sell our tickets. That is just, I totally get it. I was a presenter. I, I get it, but we have got to do things differently. And um, I think the way that you do things differently is sometimes you got to incentivize people to do it. And there are, there are people already doing it and exploring new ways of, um, um, building residencies with artists, using technology to actually live stream a performance that's taking place in their community, but is is being beamed somewhere else. I think we need more of those things so that we have some models that we can then share with the field um, and show them how it can be done. So that's kind of the dream. In the meantime, we're still doing sessions at conference around um, slow touring and um, more sustainable practice and raising up some in, um, some um, examples of that for ways that we can do it. Um, the final thing I would say is that we're hoping to highlight this conversation about how climate change is impacting um, the location of artists and and disrupting tour routes. So like in the US, right, there we can't, um, there, it's harder to route tours when there are fires happening in a certain time of year. Yeah. It's harder to route tours in the South during major floods. So what does that mean for the, um, for the financial planning and industry of, of, of making, making a living um, and, and feeding into this industry as an agency or a manager um, trying to build sustainable and effective tours that don't cost so much, but that, you know, we can't think about routing in the same way. So there's just a lot of infrastructure things that need to happen. I'll stop because there's, <laughs> there's just, the list is kind of long, but, um, but I'm excited about it. Cause I think that we have um, so many opportunities to face things differently and why, and why wouldn't we? <laughs> Thank you so much, Krista. And I, I think that really hits on also actually what, what Ben said originally in terms of, you know, climate is so absent even from education in the arts. And again, we're so far away from even recognizing just that whole list that you just talked about, Krista. Like it really does fit into all the narratives, all the discussions, everything that we talk about every day and we have to tackle it. So I guess it's again, so wonderful to have um, all of these brilliant creative climate leaders and you're all kind of doing that in your own context, bringing it into the conversation, um, sort of making those connections, I think, for everyone else. Um, ben, I think you haven't yet shared. Sure. Well, I'm still very much chewing on this idea of slow touring because that sounds amazing. <laughs> and it's sparking so many ideas in me, so thank you. Um, so yeah, the program had, has been extremely influential on some of my work. And I think uh, maybe if it's okay, I'll share two kind of pro uh, facets of, of some things. One is a personal creative project and one is sort of more in the organizational festival space. So for the festival space, yeah, thinking a lot about those slow slowing down forms, I think. Um, in April we started a sustainability team here. We put out a call in the local newspaper just to see if anyone would be interested in joining our festival team. And, and hopefully with the idea of it not being just for the festival, although the festival does need a lot of help in creating a sort of intersectional sustainability, but also in regenerating the community in which it's embedded into. Um, 
so we've been meeting monthly since then, and it's been really helpful after CCL to sort of be re-empowered and to sort of share some of the insights from that. But uh, basically what where we are right now is we did our first sort of low-hanging fruit season of trying to to do a lot of uh, the easiest ones. Uh, so that that included just meeting as a group, forming a team in, in the first place that could and 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 that actually has been really influential on ways that I didn't anticipate um, because the team is sort of separate from our staff and board. It's a team of volunteers, but the culture and energy of the team have really spread through the other parts of the organization. And so now the staff is engaging with us in different ways and we're working on more policy related things. And then like on the grounds, volunteers are more charged up and like offering, Hey, I can build some birdhouses and Hey, do you need some help with this way station or what? Let's make this, uh, you know, thing for people to write suggestions and it, so the, and Oh, I can plant some hula hoop gardens and like all these, all these things have really picked up. And that's been one of my favorite things is that, cause then I don't feel yeah. so much like things are hinging on me so much it's, it's spread around. And that's a beautiful thing too, is that I, I think we are, I mean, in this place right here in this area, there's already a lot of inspiration to do good in this, in this way of environmental work. I think there's no convincing there that needs to happen per se uh, on the level of the ground itself and putting in gardens and putting it in all that stuff. Uh, so that's been energizing. Um, and also thinking about transportation. Uh, we have sort of these uh, small goals, uh, medium term goals and 10 year goals. Um, and sort of the, we started with the big term goals, actually, what is just throwing the big dreams on the page. And so maybe I'll, I'll just read some of them. I'm, I have our little document open here, if you don't mind. Um, so how and maybe I'll frame these in questions because they're not. So how do we model festival circularity, thinking of things of systems of waste, food, renewable energy, creative energy, mentorship, economics and health? Um, how might we be an inspiring, hopeful, empowering place for future generations? What does that feel like as a from any age you're on the grounds? I entered this first being like, I want, I would love to have a festival where a younger person would feel, oh, hopeful for the future. But since starting this, some more older people have been like, well, what about us? Like, I want to feel, in, I want to feel hopeful for the for the current present as well as the future because you know we are connected between our generations too so that's been a bit of a mind shift um how might we also work meaningfully towards reconciliation understanding the lands we are on uh, how to be in reciprocal relationship and learn with the indigenous nations and teachings of our local areas um, how do we create a habitat haven for all how do we contribute contribute to community engaged regeneration, building robust partnerships and community groups and connecting with community groups already doing the work? It's not like starting from scratch um, and promoting. This is something that we're not really even close to because we don't have a sustainability page even on our website or anything like that. But ideally, sometime hoping to share insights and strategies and thoughts with other festivals and in a very. I would a couple of people on our team would love it to be more visually appealing to not just like huge long word documents policies but also like you can kind of see the system easily visually represented and so we're working on how, sort of how to communicate that in a in a fun and joyful way too um yeah and then the art projects itself too have been really important so the this work has also influenced our the art making that we do at the festival. So, and that is actually partly influenced by the pandemic too, when we couldn't gather inside, even though the barn is sort of an indoor outdoor space, it was still legally considered an indoor space. So we did, uh, we created an outdoor amphitheater as well as a campfire outside, which has led to some really interesting intimate experiences where we just take the whole venue out and we just, the land becomes the venue. So that's, changed the, the art making itself too and so we've had different kinds of compositions and projects and dancing and things that have been influenced um how do we create an, a hub for arts and environmental education too what is our role as a festival in education um and i think for us that's been a largely a partnership driven space too if there's actually a conservancy right across the, the road from the the uh, festival so they've been helping us 
learn about the lands that we're on. And also we've been working with them and doing some arts projects in there. Um, and then, yeah, the, the last one we have in our big dream list is a place for healing. So how do we develop a connection with place that feels good, that's spiritually fulfilling, and how can we be restored through, through all of that? So I, I kind of am thinking of music as the short, as, as one short form, not the be all for all of that stuff that includes land, includes other species. And, and so that you could swap different words for that, but, but not just our logistical responsibilities per se, or not just our creative responsibilities, even though those flow together organically anyways, but yeah. Oh, sorry. So that was, <laughs> I feel like I went on long enough to maybe save the personal art project for another, another time. But yeah. Thanks, Ben. Um, I think we are heading towards closing. Um, I will hand over back to you all to for any quick final thoughts. Um, but just before we do that, um, thank you so much to everyone who has tuned in for this panel and this conversation. Um, we are running more creative climate leadership programs um, and the easiest way to keep up with those is to uh, sign up for the Julie's Bicycle newsletter. We have a few coming up, a, a Canada online one, um, a, one in person in the UK and one for people who are working in Belgium, Netherlands and Luxembourg. Um, but again, we are constantly developing them with different partners in different locations. Um, so hoping to grow and expand this brilliant network of change makers. So just as we close, I was wondering uh, whether each of you might give some final parting words or words of inspiration, I think, to anyone in the creative community watching this who might be, uh, again, feeling a bit alone or wondering what to do next on climate action or um, any other inspiration you might draw on. Sign up for CCL. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, there's something really important I think we haven't mentioned yet. Or, or maybe it's just something that I'm thinking from the October experience in Sweden because we had this opportunity to meet <clears throat> some, well, essentially teenagers from the Fridays for Future movement. And they said something that really stuck with me. And we had this kind of evening chat, very relaxed. Um, and, and someone asked them, uh, so what do you want us to do as like the cultural sector? What should we do? And one of the kids said um, that, hey, honestly, you just might be our last hope. <laughs> because definitely the cultural sector has not been, or we, we're late to the party, let's be honest. Mm. And we have so much influence that we haven't utilized. And we just as humans have desperately failed in this task of getting the emissions down. Mm. Maybe we would have done better if, if the cultural sector would have joined a bit earlier and I, I just really wanted to voice that that message from 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 them it was quite quite inspiring to me well depressing but also <laughs> inspiring let's let's try to try to get out there we have much bigger influence than we may realize yeah I, I would I would echo that I would also say we need to um, look to um, ancestral and indigenous colleagues, um, the way to be sustainable is not necessarily new. And it's um, deeply embedded in, in cultures um, that are indigenous um, and black. And um, I think there's a lot to learn here. And we, um, we don't have to recreate the wheel but we probably need to just sit back and listen and learn mm -hmm. from our um, indigenous colleagues and artists um, who could really teach us a lot about how to rethink um, how we do this work, the values that we need to center. Um, I think indigeneity could be really um, important and should be, and, and it's already happening um, within those communities um, and if they would be willing to partner, if we'd be willing to listen, um, I think we would all be in a really much better stead. So um, yes, looking looking forward to the future, but looking back um, to people who have done things in ways that um, have sustained them, you know, in, in the face of so many 
difficulties um, has a lot for us to, to learn from. Maybe just picking up on that just a little bit too, I think that's so important. And uh, I think one of the big takeaways for me in the, in the last CCL was um, recognizing the complexity of all these issues and, but still how colonization is such a huge force of the creation of a lot of these issues and associated extractivism sort of mindsets and so how to rekindle that with with indigenous colleagues and and partnerships and listening and i think is part of the very important slow work too that can't happen so fast so there's i think always the conundrum of the language of we have to act now and rapid rapid sort of speak which is understandable on a very scientific level too but also i think as maybe there's a well, in any cultural way, there's uh, an understanding that that takes a lot of time too, and the slowness and the relationship building piece of that can't happen overnight. So I think it's just, there's some putting aside the timeline in the, in, in that sense too. So, mm. and, and also maybe just one last tiny little thing is just that I think everyone has something to give. <laughs> yes. And that takes different forms for, for different people in such different ways. So yeah hoping everyone can give that too. Brilliant. Thank you all so much um, for sharing all of those insights and your experiences. Um, you're all super inspiring and brilliant and all have so much to give. Uh, and with that, I'll hand back over to Tressa. Wow. Thank you so much, panelists, Krista, Petra, Ben, for this wonderful, thought-provoking, inspiring discussion with plenty of calls to action for our community. Most especially thank you to Kiara for bringing this conversation to our community today and to all of you who are watching. We would like to take this opportunity to say how grateful we are that the folks at Julie's Bicycle have taken the time to help us feature their work, share this important conversation which centers creative climate leadership in the performing arts sector. Lots of ways for you to get involved. Sign up for that juliesbicycle.com newsletter. On a final note, should you be watching this as part of Folk Alliance International's virtual conference, Folk Plus. Our online offerings are made affordable thanks to the generosity of donors. If you'd like to support our work, donations can be made at folk.org backslash donate. Stay safe and connected. Be inspired and take action. Community, we'll see you next time. Thank you so much, everyone. Goodbye. <laughs>